Bonjour tout le monde. Hello everyone. My name is Otilia Baraboy. I am the executive director of the Alliance Française de Seattle, hosting this event today. Um, just a few words about the Alliance Française de Seattle, in case you don't uh, know us. We are located in Seattle's Wallingford neighborhood in a historic building of wonderful location. We are the seventh alliance in the US in terms of number of enrollments per quarter and per year. Um, we offer cultural events, classes for um, youth and uh, all ages actually, summer camps and many um, uh, partnerships with uh, local and um, national and international institutions. So I'm very happy to um, introduce our presenter today. Um, Linda is a past president of the Fédération Alliance of uh, Alliances Francaises in the US and also an officer in France's Order of Academic Palms. And um, also, um, she is the board secretary um, at the Alliance Française de Seattle. She also visited the Côte d'Azur multiple, multiple times in the last 12 years. So, Linda, we're very excited to hear your presentation. We can go ahead. Okay, thank you, Otilia, for the introduction. Welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, be here today and to share my experiences with you. Um, do you see the opening slide, just to be certain? Okay, do you see the opening slide? Good, 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 good. I'm going to go pretty quickly today uh, through the slides, um, but I would encourage you not to take notes, just listen, because like Otilia said, we are recording, and I'd also be happy to share a copy of this presentation with anybody that wants it. So just sit back and enjoy the ride. <laughs> so as Otilia mentioned, and as in the case for many of you, I suspect, uh, you know, I have visited France a number of times, and in the first decades, I visited Paris, Nantes, Burgundy, etc. over the years for business and for pleasure. But more recently, in the last 12 years, I've concentrated my visits on the Côte d'Azur, um, which we will find out is wonderful. We are going to talk now about an overview of the region. We're going to talk about the weather, which is so important to us in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we'll talk about the hot spots, the areas you really don't want to miss. Uh, the most frequent questions, we'll be covering those as we go along, and we're going to be talking about um, some practical tips, especially toward the end. Now, just to get our orientation, do you see the map? Uh, maybe a nod of heads to make sure we're all on the same page. Thank you. Um, the Côte d'Azur, uh, the eastern edge, is 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 never debated. The eastern edge, eastern edge is on is Montan, which is on the Italian border, directly on the Italian border. And the western edge is somewhat debated. Some people think it's some people think it's Central Bay. You know, other people think it's Saint Raphael. Um, even Cassis self describes itself as being part of the Côte d'Azur. So it is uh, it is a, a specific section of France, and then we're going to see in just a minute how big it is compared to the rest of France. But it's important to note at this point that if we look at the distance, for example, from Saint-Tropez to Montan, that is less than 90 miles. Think about that because the distance between Seattle and Portland, Portland is greater than, Seattle, than, than 90 miles. So we are talking about a compact little area of the country. So looking at this area as it sits with the rest of France, France has over 100 départements. And look at Alpes-Maritimes, where the Côte d'Azur is located. It's a teeny, teeny, teeny little part of, of France. Its entire population is less than 2 million, but we have to keep in mind that 11 million people visit this region every year. And guess what? 54% of those visitors are foreign, but a hefty 46% of the visitors are from France itself. Now, why? what draws people to the Côte d'Azur? Not only the wonderful flora and fauna, but because the Côte d'Azur has wonderful weather, it has the highest sunshine index in all of France. 
So if you look at the average highs, the average highs range from, you know, something like 55 to, you know, 80, although in the summertime, June, July, and August, we are talking peaks of a very hot and humid, very hot and humid, humid 90s and 100s. But then also look at your average lows. Your average lows are from like 42. That's warm <laughs> to many of us in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the precip precipitation in just a little bit. But look at your average sunshine hours on the last row. Uh, you can see, obviously, that May, June, July, and August have the most uh, monthly sunshine hours. Staying uh, still on the weather, it's interesting to compare Nice, for example, with Paris, Strasbourg, Brest, which some of you may know. It's fascinating to me that even though Nice has so much more sunshine than Paris, for example, it also has more rain. Well, how can it have more sunshine and more rain than Paris? It's because the rain falls hard in the form of storms. So it has a lot of storms. You have short storms, particularly in the spring and the summer, and then the sun comes out. So uh, a point, a practical point about looking at the weather forecast for, no, for, for, for this region, some people when they're planning say two weeks out to be in Nice and they look at the weather forecast and they say, oh my gosh, I'm freaking out because it's good. It says rain every single day. Well, it says rain every single day because it might and will be a short burst. It's not going to be raining and drizzly all day. It's simply going to be a short burst. So don't worry about that if you see that in the weather forecast. And then other people, the people that live in these, tell me that the rain often is limited to the hilly ranges a little bit inland from the coast and not at the seafront itself. So another reason not to worry so much if you, if you hear that or if you see that you're going to be encountering some weather. And then note at the very bottom, I have, have mentioned that of, of all the Côte d'Azur, Monton has the highest number of sunny days in, in all of France. So since we're talking about the weather, let's go ahead and talk about seasons and planning. I'll be honest with you, I'm going to state completely upfront that I am a huge fan of only traveling to the Côte d'Azur, to the French Riviera in the low season or the shoulder season, okay? Um, I have traveled in, uh, to the Côte d'Azur in, uh, well, actually to Nice, in uh, January, February, um, April, and September, okay? maybe even one time at the tail end of August and right into the beginning of September. Okay, so I can tell you that there, in my, from my perspective, since there's lots of sun all year long, that there are no disadvantages to the low or shoulder season except for these two. One, the smaller villages may feel a teeny bit less vibrant and, but they'll definitely feel less crowded. And then some restaurants, hotels and stores that are particularly oriented to the tourist business may not be open in the off season, but that is again, mainly in the small towns. If you're in Nice in the off season, then pretty much everything that you need is definitely open because Nice is a major city as we'll discover in just a minute. And then let's look in a little more detail at the high season. Well, the pro, the main pro for the high season being July, August, uh, June, July, August, is that if you love to live on the beach, then that's where you, that's when you probably want to be on the Côte d'Azur. But let's look at all the cons. The hotel rooms are often unavailable or since surge pricing is in play, they will be more expensive. There will be long lines for attractions. There's no way around it. There will be packed trams, trains, and buses to the extent that you may give up on the public transportation because in some cases it's essentially not usable. And I, I know people that have found this to be the case. They've watched, they planned to go to like Monaco one day and they were at the train station in Nice and they watched four trains go by and they couldn't get on because it was sardines. I've had that happen to me one time. So I know how frustrating it is. Um, also buses that go by and they say complet bus after bus after bus. If you're traveling in the high season, that is truly something that you risk. And then your restaurant uh, reservations can be difficult. They can be made many months in advance, but they can, they're much less 
difficult in the lower shoulder season. And frankly, because thieves kind of thrive on closely packed bodies that they can get next to, you will have likely more theft activity and, and you'll feel a little bit more at risk for that. Again, the pro for the high season is extreme vibrancy and more beach activity. I'm gonna put a plug for the Alliance Francaise here. <laughs> you knew that that was coming, I hope. Um, speaking French will dramatically deepen and enrich your experience. Uh, you know, you could have a typical tourist experience where you understand nothing <laughs> culturally that's happening around you, but if you understand French, you will understand and appreciate a lot more of what's happening around you. And you'll have, you know, valid exchanges with the, with the French shop owners or the restaurant owners and so forth. Now, what to do if you're rebuffed because you're doing your great effort to speak French and then the waiter or the uh, restaurant owner speaks back to you in perfect English. Um, what you do in that case is you keep on speaking French. They will eventually turn back to you. They're actually trying to do you a favor by speaking English, but they'll turn back to your French if you persist. Um, I traveled with my husband who's German and he doesn't speak a word of French except for bonjour. <laughs> we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but uh, so when we would order in the restaurants and so forth, they would speak to me in French and they would speak to him in English. And it was perfectly manageable. And then what to always lead with, here we lead with, you have to in France, you must absolutely without fail, always, always, always lead with bonjour. If you don't lead with bonjour, it can be traumatic. And I simply mean truly traumatic. So don't risk it, just always lead with bonjour, no matter what. And then um, I put a little vocabulary in there. But one time when I was visiting Côte d'Azur, I saw these little signs that said casino here, you know, half kilometer casino there, casino there. I, oh my gosh, there's so much gambling. Well, casino is of course the name of a, uh, a national grocery chain. Okay, so if you see casino signs, that's probably what it's referring to. And I threw in some words, these, uh, when I eavesdropped on conversations, accidentally, of course, in the restaurants or on the bus. And so, du uh, coup, franchement, et donc voilà. Those were the three most common expressions I heard being used by, by natives in their, in their conversations. And then finally on this slide, if you are interested in, a, in an experience of say two weeks in the uh, Côte d'Azur and you would like an intensive class, you can do no better than the Institut Français in Villefranche. If you're interested in that, you can, you can email me and I'll, I'll send you information and refer you to the director. Uh, also, there is a wonderful Alliance Française uh, right smack dab in the, the center of Nice. So that is another option, especially if you're looking for less than a two week commitment. Okay, now we're really getting to the, to the meat of the presentation where I'm gonna introduce you to first the top seven targets that are generally speaking must do's, must see. And then after that, I'm gonna have seven sub targets, but I think you're gonna find them all interesting in their own way. Um, they, the first seven that we're gonna be talking about are all easy, very easy to get to. They're very close to Nice. They are all walkable, but when we say walkable, don't forget, we are talking significant hills, significant hills, maybe not in the downtown area, but sometimes in the in the old town, uh, you will find lots of hills because a lot of the places we'll be talking about are seafront villages that rise up, up away from the, the, the sea or they're hilltop villages that are way up from the sea, okay? But what you're gonna find as we go through these, I think that each of them is charming in their own way. They all have different vibes. They all have different ambiance. They all have different orientations. Uh, and, 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 I, and I've chosen illustrations that I think will help illustrate them all. Before we get to those illustrations though, I just wanna point out to you something that you should really be aware of. And that is a ranking by size of our top seven targets. Nice in red here is in a category on its own because it is the capital city. It has a huge population. It has the third busiest airport in, in all of France uh, behind Orly and Champ de Bonne Etoile. And um, it's, this is really important, the airport bit, because if your luggage is lost, which mine has been lost, then if you're in Nice or near Nice, then you can go camp 
at the airport and try to track down your luggage, you know, hopefully you have a tile or something, but it's of course much more convenient when your luggage does come in to get it to you or to pick it up if you have easy access to the Nice airport, okay? The yellow grouping are, are, are towns or villages that are one-tenth the size of Nice. So as you can imagine, much less amenities, but a charm of a entirely different source, uh, uh, type. By the way, on Nice, just because it's a big city doesn't mean it's charming. You're gonna see that it's utterly charming when we get to the, the details on Nice. Now, our third grouping is even smaller. These towns and population are less than something like a one one hundredth of the size of Nice in population, but they're world famous. They're, they're fantastic for their own merits, and we'll be exploring each of these as we go through our pictures. Now, do you see the four pictures? Nod, okay, good. We're gonna start at the upper left and then I'll work our way across and then down. We're gonna start off in Nice here. Okay, the high points in Nice, of course, are the Promenade des Anglais, which is actually to the left of the left-hand uh, palm trees. Uh, many, many art museums, Chagall, uh, Chagall uh, Matisse, uh, a contemporary art museum, many, many art museums, castles, ruins that people like to visit with wonderful viewpoints. It has got, Nice has an old town. If you like old towns, it has an old town that you could get lost in for two days, literally. And then you have the open air Coupe Salaya market. You, uh, you have pebble beaches, which is a distinction um, for Nice. And um, so there you have, you know, like an emblematic photo of Nice uh, that shows the Hotel Negresco, which is just one of the, one of the beautiful architecture. You can walk around all of downtown or seafront Nice and see fabulous, fabulous, wonderful architecture. And you do not feel like you're in a big city because the town goes and grows inland and that's where all the residents live is mostly inland. Okay, then to the right, we have Antibes, which remember is in the much smaller category. Look at the different ambiance in, in Antibes. What is the predominant feature? It's the ramparts, uh, the remparts that surround the old fortress fortifications. Uh, you can walk the, the remparts, which uh, I did in April, and you can spend hours ogling the very incredibly expensive uh, private boats that are there. Um, Antibes is also famous for its, its wonderful Marché Provençal, uh, its Picasso Museum, and also I like the art galleries and local craft creations that you can find just before you get, it's a 10 minute walk from the train station to the Marché Provençal, just before you get to the Marché Provençal. I love the artists that are exhibited there. So Antibes, again, has a completely different vibe than Nice. Now we get to the bottom two, which are the first four of our top seven. Uh, Cannes, look at the vibe in Cannes. Cannes is centered around the Cannes Film Festival and the Conference Center, which is right on the seafront. And there is a nice kind of garden stretch on the seafront, but it's everything in Cannes is very much, uh, you know, about elegance, it's about luxury. It's a great place to people watch. It has a small old town, but it's, you know, compared to all the other old towns, it's, you know, kind of negligible. Uh, it is very much centered on the film festival and very, very rich people. So I like to go there for people watching. They also uh, have nice beaches in Cannes. Now, Monte Carlo, like Cannes, is synonymous with luxury and big money, etc. But hold on for a second. Look at those skyscrapers. Have you seen skyscrapers in any of the other images that I've shown you? This makes Monte Carlo totally different than the others in its ambiance. It has the densest population on the entire Côte d'Azur with 40,000 people in one square mile. So these last two, Khan and Monte Carlo, I'll be honest with you, they tend to land, land in a special category called love-hate. People either love Cannes and Monte Carlo or they hate Cannes and Monte Carlo. I'm not gonna tell you my preferences, but uh, you'll have to discover that on your own. And then our last three of the initial four top targets, Es Village on the upper left is on everyone's list since it's a tiny hilltop village, medieval village. Now, as a tiny hilltop village, it has barely room for two people to walk abreast in its pathways. 
It is mobbed all the time from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. It is, it is utter chaos <laughs> because everyone wants to go to Ez. You have wonderful views of Cap Ferrat. You have, you know, just stellar views from this, from this hilltop garden, but you have to be ready to be one of a thousand bajillion tourists that are there at the same time as you. And also your transportation to and from Ez is, is quite complicated. Uh, I mean, it's not that far from Nice, and if you take the right bus, it's really easy, but you have to take the upper level buses and not the lower level buses, uh, you know, unless you take the lower level bus that goes to Beaulieu sur Mer and then to the Gare and then up the hill. So it's kind of, you know, it's, you know, by the time you get there, you're going to go, and then you have a thousand bajillion tourists. Okay, Villefranche sur Mer to the right again, has a totally different vibe. We are now down at the seafront. Villefranche-sur-Mer is a 10 minute bus ride from Nice. It feels completely different than Nice, absolutely different. It has the deepest harbor of all of the Mediterranean. This is where all the big cruise ships go, but they park out in the harbor or they <laughs> drop anchor, I should say, out in the harbor. And then they have their Sunday little shuttle bus with all the tourists and the tourists gets on, the tourists gets, they get on boats, uh, on buses and they go to the other parts of the Côte d'Azur. Anyway, um, it, it, it's just a beautiful kind of tranquil town. You can see everything's built right around the harbor there. There are some, uh, there's a citadel, a fortress. There's a small chapel painted by Cocteau. The, as you can see, the charming old town is right on the water. Restaurants on the harbor are, uh, you know, in Villefranche, very famous. And it has a sandy public beach. beach. Remember I told you Nice has a pebble beach. Well, Villefranche has a sandy beach. And I was there when they were adding sand. <laughs> so it's probably artificial sand, but it's still a sandy beach. And it is also popular because it's, it's train station, which gets the same level of service as all of the other train stations on the Côte d'Azur. Um, the train station is, is just a few steps from the beach, so it's very convenient. And then finally on the bottom, wrapping up our top seven, we have Cap Ferrat, which is literally a cape. And the small town that's on it is called Port Saint-Jean, which is just charming. So Cap Ferrat is, is very famous for having the most, uh, some of the most luxury residences, the highest real estate in all of France. Um, it is famous for the grand private villas, some of which you can tour. It has a absolutely amazing uh, uh, footpath along the eastern side, which I went to almost every two to three days, simply was so stunning and such a nice walk. And then uh, Port Saint-Jean is often overlooked by people, but it's well connected by bus to, to Nice and so forth. Uh, it has very nice restaurants at the, at the port sea level. Um, uh, by the way, Cap Ferra is very famous uh, more recently because that's where some of the filming of the episodes of Emily in Paris took place. And then also the Rolling Stones uh, rented a villa there. Uh, I think it's called Nel Cote, and um, that's where they created some of their epic recordings. So uh, is 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 that's why it's on everybody's top list. It's, it's simply simply stunning. Now we went through a lot of targets, but they're all remember they're all close together. Now I want to talk to you about seven other targets that are a little bit less well known, but some of them are. Are, are also quite well known. These you would normally tackle along with some of your other targets or, or if you have time separately. The two in yellow, th these are not racked by population, the two in yellow um, indicate they are somewhat less discovered than the others. Uh, sometimes if you tell somebody you went to Montan, they'll say, where's that? You know, And then you know that it's less discovered. Uh, Mougin is just being discovered now. I'll tell you more about it in just a minute. And then the two in the purple category, they kind of fall into the love-hate category that we ended our initial seven with. And we'll, we'll talk about each of those individually. So to give you an idea of their ambiance, again, some, some representative images. This is one shot of Montan. It happens to be of their uh, recently completed new boulevard, kind of like Boulevard des Anglais, Promenade des Anglais, on the de Montan. It's, it's very, very nice. It's got a lot of restaurants at the, at the water level, a lot of amenities for families, the beach. You can see the beach is huge. And this is just one of the beaches in Montan. There are many beaches in Montan because there's, there's at least two bays. This particular bay is the one that, 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 that France shares with Italy, which makes it kind of fun. And here you're looking at the old city. 
And uh, so Montan, FYI, is the top retirement destination for the French people themselves. So if you're wanting to hear a little bit more French than you would hear in Nice or some of the other cities, this is where you would go. It has a flat pedestrian area and a hilly old town. It has wonderful gardens, a basilica, churches, the bays that I mentioned, and it has the distinction, for some reason, of having the top Michelin restaurant on, on the Côte d'Azur. Now to its right, you see Beaulieu sur Mer, which if you flip back to Villefranche sur Mer, is right next to Beaulieu, uh, uh, is, right, is right next to Villefranche. So Beaulieu is, is adjacent there, but it's totally different than Villefranche because it has a lushly landscaped harbor stretch and it has more elegant shopping and better shopping, both practical and luxury. So often people will stay in Villefranche and then come to Beaulieu for their shopping and just to enjoy the, the vibe or the ambiance of, of Beaulieu. Uh, it also has a Super U, which if you're staying at any of the all other small towns, Super U is a very, very good big grocery store without being an hyper marché. And so, and it's located right next to the train station in Beaulieu. So a lot of people who are staying in other nearby towns, they'll take the train to Beaulieu, do their shopping, hop on the train and go home. Now on the bottom, we have saint paul de vence which you know, 10, 15 years ago, it wasn't terribly, terribly, terribly well known to tourists, only to the French. Now all the tourists know about it too. It is a charming hilltop village with, you know, your typical mix of art galleries and so forth. And it also has, it has two fantastic restaurants just before you enter the village grounds. You do have to make reservations at one of them. That's the Colombe d'Or. And we uh, dined there on our last trip a couple months ago, and it was the best dining experience that we had on the entire trip. And then rounding out our second seven, we have Moujin, which like Ez, and like Saint-Paul-de-Vence is a hilltop village. Uh, all three of those, by the way, these hilltop villages are, are within a 10 to 15 minute bus ride down to the beach. Okay, Mougin, look at the estates. Because uh, Mougin, the old town is at the very top, but all these beautiful estates are what you have to kind of walk through. It's a 12 minute path up to the village, unless there's a shuttle running, which does run in the high season, but not in the shoulder season. And it is utterly uh, stunning. Uh, we actually prefer Ez or we prefer Mougin now to Ez or Saint-Paul-de-Vence because they have wonderful restaurants that aren't overcrowded. The whole place is not overcrowded because nobody, not everybody knows about it yet. And they have an amazing, they have a, a, amazing outdoor statues to where I felt like it was for the first time in my life in an out, outdoor art museum. Really, really, really stunning. And then by the way, the reason for these estates luxury estates is because it's just outside of Cannes. So if you are very rich and you want a pied-à-terre in France that's near the Cannes Film Festival, then you buy your luxury estate here. Okay, Joan des Pins is more for families. Look at the vibe. Look at those buildings. None of the architecture that you've seen so far in all the other towns, right? What do they look like to you? To me, they look like they were built in the 1960s or 1970s completely different vibe, much more of a beachy resort type of area for families. They even have nets in the water to keep the stinging jellyfish away from the children. So, you know, if you're looking for primarily beach activities and maybe less expensive than, than Nice, then Joan Les Pins is very, very popular also for some nice nightlife. Now, the bottom two, again, they are in the love-hate relationship. Saint Tropez is not very popular at all at this time because it is, it is not on the same train line as all of the other cities that we'll be talking about today. Saint Tropez is, is, is reachable by ferry or by different trains and buses than the normal ones. And it takes two and a half or three hours to get there and then to come back. So sometimes people take a ferry ride from Nice and they spend a the whole day. In other words, they take the ferry in the morning, they have lunch in Saint-Tropez, they sit on the beach for a little while, and then they come back. So, but Saint-Tropez is again, one of those towns where some people say, leave it off your list because there's so much else to discover more tightly within the Nice area. And then finally, on our overview of the seven, um, of the second seven, you have Grasse, which is actually a city, a full-fledged city of its own. It tries to attract 
the tourist business of people that want to visit the Côte d'Azur. Uh, but many people say that if you're seeking the perfume experience, which is which is unique to Grasse, they say you can get the Fragonard perfume experience in Es and, and drop Grasse from your visit list. Again, these last two fall in the category of love-hate. Okay, so Otilia, how are we doing on time? Are we doing, we're doing pretty good, I think. Yeah, okay, yeah, so you now, still. Thank you, Otilia. We're gonna uh, switch to a, a big question that everybody asks. With all these wonderful choices, where should I have my home base? Like, where do I get my hotel room? And then I catch the train to go up this very convenient train line and get off at each of the stations and then walk in 10 minutes and I'm to the old town. Well, Nice, is voted by many to be the home base because of the airport and because of the convenience and because it has actually five train stations um, very close by to all of these other wonderful points of interest. And then even Montan and Cannes are reachable in 30 to 35 minutes. So a lot of people say at Nice because it's smack dab in the middle of all the action, okay? That said, some people like Villefranche is their home base. Some people like, and I don't understand why, but they like as, as their home base. Um, some people like Antibes as their home base. It all depends on what kind of vibe you're looking for on your, on your vacation. Uh, to the left, you actually have the uh, building where I stayed in my last trip to uh, the Côte d'Azur. This was in Villefranche-sur-Mer. My apartment was the first one on the upper left above the restaurant, but I didn't hear any noise any time from this wonderful restaurant, which is highly rated, by the way, uh, because the building is so solid. And then a convenience was, this is with my husband in the lower photo, he's at the back gate to our building. And yes, that is the train that you see 10 yards from our building. So we had wonderful access to the train station, which by the way, is a teeny tiny train station, which is not even manned most days of the week, but, it, um, um, but it's just darn, darn convenient. And it served at the same level of service as every other city, Nice, Cannes, Antibes, et cetera. Pretty amazing convenience for us. Now on lodging, a lot of you will be looking at uh, comparing hotels versus Airbnb or VRBO. Uh, this welcome hotel is in Villefranche. It's kind of popular because it's the only one that's right on the water. It's pretty famous. Uh, I think it was also filmed in Emily in Paris. The welcome hotels rooms go for, they're not big, and they go for, you know, 400 to 1,000 a night. Uh, and there is definitely surge pricing. So depending on the part of the year you go, it's going to be it's going to be lower or higher pricing depending on the demand. I do want to remind you that France has very strict laws regarding uh, short term rentals. So you want to make sure that whatever you're doing is legit. You don't want to be taken by a scam, even on Facebook. Some of the groups that I'll be recommending to you, you don't want to be connecting with those people. Uh, unless they also have their listings on Airbnb and so forth, so that you can be sure that you're not sending, you know, $2,000, $4,000, $5,000 to a scam artist. And that does happen quite a lot. I only go through a Airbnb or VRBO. Now, what about the Airbnb, VRBO experience? A lot of it will depend on your length of stay. Since we were staying for a long time, we chose an Airbnb. And um, the amenities, of course, are different because you have your washing machine. You don't have to hand it over to the hotel. Uh, you, you learn that there are no drivers on the Côte d'Azur, <laughs> that everybody hangs their, uh, or their laundry out on, on you know, laundry lines to dry. Uh, you learn how to live like a resident. Um, this is us having an informal dinner on our patio, which overlooked the uh, Cap Ferra, and of course, the this is the harbor of Villefranche. And um, so, yeah, you learn to live like a resident, you do your recycling like French people, and you know, it's a different experience than staying in a hotel, definitely. So if you're interested in this particular building, which in which many of the uh, 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 apartments are owned by an American couple that rents them out to people as their business, if you're interested, then you can uh, send me a, an email. Okay, travel and transportation in general, 
there's always a huge discussion among people, uh, should I rent a car or should I use public transportation? Public transportation in France, unless you're there in the super high season, is definitely preferable. 90% of the tourists that go to the Côte d'Azur are going to be using public transportation. Parking is expensive, it's hard to find, and um, it's a hassle. Uh, so, it, it, you know, if you if you drive your car to Ez, you can't have a glass of wine with lunch and then drive home. You know, you have to be aware of those rules as well. Some people were concerned that these strikes would be too disruptive uh, for planning to use the public transportation. I can tell you, I was in France when they had the uh, pension reform uh, strikes, which were all over the place. It did not affect my travel at all on the public transportation. There are two websites in, on the Côte d'Azur that publish a day in advance any disruptions to the trains. So you can always plan at the last minute to change, to, you know, to make changes uh, to accommodate a slight disruption in, in the service. And then Google Maps uh, is, is very handy. Uh, Moveit.com uh, is also very handy. Europeans themselves tend to prefer Rome to Rio for getting around. Whenever I wanted to go somewhere, like, you know, we woke up and said, oh, let's go to Saint Paul d'Avance today. Then I would simply put it into Google Maps and, and look at the four or five different ways to get to Saint Paul d'Avance and decide which one I wanted to do that day because, you know, there were obviously many different choices. And then people do love Uber and Volt in France. The uh, Uber is much less expensive than your traditional taxi. There are some restrictions on what Uber can and can't do around the airport. There are restrictions of what taxis that are located in the suburbs can do in terms of driving downtown. So uh, you may encounter a little bit of that. But overall, I took a taxi once uh, from the airport, which I do recommend, and, uh, and, and I didn't have any problems with the public transportation. So let's talk about the trains, because when you're traveling on the Côte d'Azur, there are two primary ways to get around if you're using the public transportation. One of them is the train line, which is the SNCF or TER, which I think is something about regional trains. It's just a straight line from Montan, you know, all the way to where it ends, that's Cannes. Uh, it, and you do deal generally with the SNCF tickets, which is a train ticket. You do deal differently with a different platform than you do when you're buying bus or tram tickets. Okay, so first let's talk about trains. You do have to composte or valide your uh, pass with the trains, specifically when you're getting on the platform at, at, at Nice's main station, at Niceville. Uh, sometimes I think they call it Thiers. Um, anyway, in all the other stations, you don't have to show or tap your pass unless you're asked by the controller to do so, okay? Another reason to travel in the off season is you're not likely to miss the train that you bought your tickets for. Uh, recently, I heard of somebody when the trains were all jammed and they couldn't get on two trains and so they caught the next one, which is exactly the same price because it's the same trajet of what they had booked. The controller kicked them off the train, which was not a good experience. And uh, so you basically sign up online for the SNCF app. It's very easy to set up your account. And then you simply pay your tickets every time you book them on the app. And then that puts this little scanner thing on your phone, which is fine. You can also use the ticket machines that are next to the, that in the train station, but they're very complicated to use. And most Americans hate them, really, really hate them. So we all recommend very strongly, anybody that's been there, use the SNCF Connect app, which is not super easy, but once you get used to it, it's okay. Now, I told you that's a completely other system, which is the bus and tram system. It's called, it's all part of a thing called the Ligne d'Azur. You can see it kind of in the middle there. And um, that's a different website. When I was there in April, you used to be able to buy these, you know, kind of like a pass that gave you, it was kind of like the old carnet that got you 10, 10 trips for 10 euros. Well, that's a euro a trip, right? Well, the it used to be when I was there, the year the trip trip ticket was one euro fifty and 10, 10 trips for 10 euros. Pretty good deal, right? I'm so sorry, because on July 1st, the French 
completely overhauled the ticketing system. <laughs> so now the base ticket is a Euro 70 instead of a Euro 50, and there are no more multi da 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 passes, except if you buy a, and, and, and everybody is required now to buy a rechargeable, a rechargeable card that you top up, top up online uh, or in the train station, and then you simply tap it whenever you need to use it. This is brand new. It is, uh, it is a big mess. Uh, I will just say one thing to you that the Minu d'Azur and the SNCF don't really do a lot to facilitate things for tourists. Like when I was there, I said, well, I'm over 65. Shouldn't I be able to get a discount? No, 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 no. Not easily anyway. And then, or I'd like to buy, you know, a week's pass. When I was there, no, 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 not easily. There is something now that's called some kind of a week or month pass, but uh, most people have calculated that they would never rack up that much uh, value in the time period. So most people are just doing the ticket by ticket on the rechargeable, on the rechargeable passes. Also for your online guidance, you may look up online and you say, uh, how do you go from Nice to Villefranche or something like that? Or you might encounter a, a web page that tells you how to go and they'll say, take the 100 bus between Nice and Villefranche. Well, the one, they change the bus numbers all the time. So always check the Ligne d'Azur site. I mean, the bus number between Nice and Villefranche is now 15 or 67. When I was there 10 years ago, it was, you know, or five years ago, it was the bus 100. Don't trust the bus lines that you find online unless you find them on the Ligne d'Azur site. Okay. Linda, just a quick note that you're a little bit over 35 minutes. Okay. Okay. Good. I think our timing is pretty good because we are at, we are on the last six or seven slides. So we should um, even five. Thank you, Otili. I think we're going to make good time and then we'll have some time at the end for uh, questions or comments. The one thing I always have to remind myself when I go to Europe is that coins are important. <laughs> In the United States, you know, when do you pay with coins? Never, right? In, in France, you pay with coins a lot. So whenever I go to Europe, France, for example, I take an old fashioned little coin purse that you can buy on Amazon for just a few dollars. You know, it opens up like this and then you shake the coins out in your hand. Two Euro and one Euro coins can add up very fast. You could end up with you know, $40 right in this handy little coin purse. And they do like to take the Euro coins and payments. They'd rather do that than make payment for a bill. Okay, so do remember that one Euro and two Euros are important. Microchips, contactless payments are all over France. Your credit card will never leave your hand. It will never go back into the kitchen with the waiter. It will always be in your hands. And that's very important because seven years ago, I did visit the Cote d'Azur. My card went back to the kitchen. And then when I got home, somebody had purchased $7,000 of Yves Saint Laurent or whatever, uh, Louis Vuitton uh, luggage. Okay. Fortunately, you know, they used my credit card. So it was fraud and, and I got reimbursed. But uh, it's really nice now that in most of Europe, and, and very much so in France, your credit card never leaves your hand. Okay, pickpockets are a problem. I myself have been pickpocketed, not in the Côte d'Azur, but pickpocketed elsewhere in Europe. Pickpockets thrive, on the two things to remember, they thrive on diversions, created diversions or accidental diversions, and they thrive on what else? Easy proximity to their targets. So the packed trains, the packed buses, the tram that leaves the airport, that's, those are their prime, uh, you know, grounds. Some pickpockets will even come up to you in a group and they'll start to strike up a conversation in very good English with you and say, can I help you with anything? And in the meantime, their partners are ruffling, rifling through your bag. So women do have a crossbody or a sling bag. Never show your money out in public. Try not to do your cash machines out in public. Uh, and so forth. Just always be aware of your surroundings, especially on the on the, on the public transportation. Uh, this is another reason why I always take a taxi uh, or an Uber from the airport when I arrive, because one luggage does not roll very easily over cobblestone streets. Many hotels you'll find are maybe up a hill. You don't want to be rolling your luggage up a hill. And and um, and three, you're not going to be encountering any kind of uh, issue with uh, theft 
or even mental confusion when you get off the, the, the plane and you're all jet lagged and you're not thinking correctly. So just leave the driving to the taxi driver. Safe security, I just wanna say that I was a little bit taken aback that none of the Airbnbs that I looked at in France offered security uh, in terms of safes. So if you're really stuck on a safe, then you probably need to stay in a hotel. Restaurants, a couple of practical tips for you. People that live in France get really mad at the tourists because the tourists don't understand that service is included. It's just like always included. You can scrutinize your bill and you'll find it there, you know, the service line. You can leave a little bit extra, you know, maybe it was a hundred euro meal, maybe you'll leave, you know, up to five euros, but, but many people that live in France, the natives will tell you, please don't tip exuberantly because it ruins it for everybody else. Uh, also, point number two, I just laid out aperitif, entrée plat, non dessert. I just want you to know that as a tourist, you know, the waiter will return to you, qu'est-ce que vous prenez comme aperitif, madame? You know? Uh, no, I don't want an aperitif. I don't even want an entrée. I just want the plat principal. Don't feel obligated to have a five-course dinner or lunch just because the waiter seems to indicate that that's the norm. No, French people and, and tourists as well should order as much as they can eat because also doggy bags are not very uh, well accepted in France. Okay, um, wines you order uh, in the Pacific Northwest, we turn, tend to order our wines by the, by the grape. Forget that. You know, just ask the waiter what his house wine is or what he recommends or she recommends. And it's usually by region that you're going to get your wines. Beer on draft, your beer drinker. My husband got used to ordering un demi, uh, but then he realized that there were always at like two sizes and well, that they were all very different in size. Sometimes the grand was 25 centiliters or 33 centiliters. So he ended up just simply saying petit ou grand. Okay, and then uh, if you don't want to order a five euro bottle of mineral water, uh, the code for that or avoiding that is simply ordering une carafe d'eau. So you're basically saying you just want some tap water. They will bring you a little pitcher of water or they will bring you a glass of water and you know nine times out of ten they're not going to charge you for just tap water. All right. My husband loved, just a tip for you, the café gourmand. At the end of a nice meal, he would order the Café Gourmand, which is shown there in the upper picture. And it is a coffee, uh, whatever style of coffee you want. And then a sampling of usually three to four small pieces of the chef's preferred desserts for the day. Doesn't that look fantastic? And this was 12 euros. Yeah, he very much grew attached to the Café Gourmand. And of course, I helped him with it. Uh, reservations are recommended for the better restaurants. I went to a restaurant in Nice that uh, Brigitte Macron uh, recently made famous. So I did have to make a reservation there, but everywhere else, oh, in Colombo, I had a reservation. Other places I didn't have reservations because I wasn't there in high seasons. If you're interested in, in hearing French conversation and encountering French culture at your meals, then, then go your big dinner or your big meal of the day could be at lunchtime. You're going to see more French natives at lunchtime. In the evening, it's going to be mainly tourists. And then just a couple of other practical considerations. Yes, um, scarves. I usually up my fashion game in France just because I always have, because the French have a natural lack for, uh, knack for fashion that, that, that I don't have. So I always up my fashion game. Uh, there's always a debate on whether you should do shorts or capris. I fall in the capris category being a little bit conservative. Uh, layering light jackets, very important because even in April when I was there, there would be the rainy sunburst and then there would be the cloud coming out. And so we were constantly all day long putting on or taking off our jacket and our layers. Very important to remember layering. Avoid clothes that need dry cleaning because dry cleaning is very slow and very expensive in France. Very slow, very expensive. You may have moved on to your next destination by the time your dry cleaning is ready. Uh, walking Hills shoes, the best investment I did was a pair of really, really good Skechers uh, because you are walking in the hills and so forth. And then let me see, uh, a friend of mine who lives in Menton insisted 
<laughs> you might be here today, that uh, I add that most of the Cote d'Azur, you can dress fairly informally, but not in Cannes and Monaco. So remember I told you those were the luxury, elegant areas. Very quick note on beaches. Everyone always gets surprised in Nice because it's pebbles, 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 pebbles. Some of the other beaches are sand. So when you're planning to go to a beach and you prefer sand, you need to look up where on Google, where are the sandy beaches on the Côte d'Azur? You do need to rent reserve. Sometimes you can just walk up and find them. Sometimes you can't rent reserve a beach chair and umbrella, or you can bring you know, your own towel and just rough it on your own. And those are just some of the places listed there at the bottom that people really like the beaches. And Cap Terra, I think I mentioned it early, Paloma Beach is the most picturesque beach, is voted the most picturesque beach um, on all of the Côte d'Azur. So definitely worth a visit to Plage Paloma. I think one of our very last slides is on shopping and more. Uh, when I'm in France, I always enjoy, uh, and also on the Côte d'Azur, the open markets, open air markets for food and crafts. Wherever you're staying, you can ask, when and where are the markets? Because they're not often every day. In Villefranche, the market was on Wednesday morning and on Saturday morning. And there were different things offered at both of those markets. Some of the vendors repeated, but some of them didn't. So I really liked shopping in the open air markets and talking with the vendors. It was very instructional. Operating hours and days for restaurants and shops, very, very much. I'm used to going to Safeway 24 seven or Whole Foods right? Practically 24 seven. It never occurred to me as it does in France, your grocery stores close often uh, one and a half days per week. And so you have to memorize the grocery store schedule. Same thing for the shops. They may close in the afternoon a little bit. Uh, restaurants may close in the afternoon if they're not service continue. You have to get used to these changes and you have to plan for them. Some people chase museum free entry days. I personally don't think those are worth going after because they're few and far between. They hardly ever do them and it's really just not worth it. Now, as far as resources, other than what I shared with you today in this presentation, I think you would find it immensely useful to visit a, a Facebook group like the one that, that I am currently a lead contributor on, uh, this particular one. You can go to, on the Facebook page, you join the group, and then you can search on the group, and you can search the word itinerary, and you'll come up with hundreds and hundreds of posts where people who live there or who have traveled there um, describe their itineraries, what they did first, what they did second, what they did on the way back from Montan, et cetera, et cetera. And then also Google and Google Maps, as I mentioned before, those are your big, big tools. And then now we have just a few minutes for uh, questions and comments. Otilia, did we have anything during um, the chat? We have a lot of um, very nice comments and people sharing experience. We do have a question about accents. If uh, somebody, Michelle, wanted to know if you noticed the variation in the southern, uh, you know, accent, you know, the famous um, <laughs> difficult uh, accent I, to understand. I, pers oh, I personally on the Côte d'Azur uh, did not notice any accident, uh, accents. I did have one time a teacher speak to me in what he would call his accent on the Côte d'Azur. He did it in an exaggerated way, but I can tell you that that... 99.999% of the time, your standard continental French accent that you learn at the Alliance Francaise is going to be fine. Your listening comprehension may be difficult, but that's just because you're an American trying to listen to rapid fire French, okay? It's not gonna be, in my opinion, an issue of accents. There is one thing to mention here that uh, you should probably be aware of, is that Nice, Montan, a lot of these cities have huge Italian populations. So the French that may be spoken to you might be influenced by an Italian accent more than anything that's local. You see what I mean? Uh, uh, and, and, and me, I'm, you know, I'm a fairly advanced speaker. I really couldn't, didn't notice that until toward the end, I started noticing, you know, that the shopkeeper in this, you know, one particular shop, she was Italian, da 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 da. But yeah, accents are not, not an issue, certainly not like they are if you go to uh, Mont Montreal or French Canada. Okay, any other questions? 
Like I said, mostly comments, but uh, feel free to um, ask, you know, unmute your microphone and ask directly questions or type them in the chat. Okay, I see, you know, I didn't mention it. Robbie mentioned that she went with a small tour group. There's nothing wrong with a small tour group. Uh, uh, you know, everybody likes to do it differently. I'm also seeing a lot on the Facebook group that people will like, say book seven to 10 days in Nice. And then for two of those days, they'll have guided tours, maybe wine tasting a little bit deeper into Provence, a little bit more inland. Uh, and certainly nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with trying to describe, to discover things on your own. Uh, guided tours are, are very nice uh, experience as well. Uh, somebody did comment on the necessity of saying bonjour. Uh, I, if we had more time, I could tell you about all of my experiences forgetting to say bonjour and how I suffered <laughs> afterward. Uh, but I, I'll just warn you, always say bonjour. Mm -hmm. uh, mouvement, mouvement sociaux is, I believe that it is correct. Uh, first time somebody else pickpocketed Nice. Yeah. Now, Michelle, then how did they get into your bag if you had your hand on the enclosure? Is Michelle still here? Maybe not. Okay. Well, we are just about out of time. If anybody would like to come off their microphone, a uh, microphone, or allumez votre micro, and then and then make another uh, comment or or any questions, then we have a few seconds for that. I yeah, I would just I would just comment that I was on back to back Rhodes Scholar tours. One was in uh, Florence, and the other was the south of France. And South of France was uh, Provence and the Côte d'Azur. And our tour guide, Marc Pain, was outstanding in terms of providing excellent um, background in terms of the, uh, the history, the culture, uh, and so forth. So we were really immersed. Not only were we there, but we also were immersed in, uh, in the culture and the and the art and the architecture and so forth through the lectures. And there are a lot of, um, in Provence, of course, there are a lot of Roman ruins. We also had, in Provence and also in the Côte d'Azur, we had uh, lecturers who lived in the areas. And so, for example, we uh, had a lecture on the, on the Russian, Russian history. And in, in Nice, we saw the inside of the Orthodox Church. Uh, we went to the Musée Picasso in Antibes and so forth. So it really was an enriching experience. And again, we didn't have any, we did not take public transportation. We either walked, we did a lot of walking <laughs> on the cobblestone streets. So definitely, you know, good, good pair of shoes are, are important. Uh, but we had a lot of free time. We had free time too. And the picture in back of me that I took in Saint-Paul-de-Vence, um, it was absolutely outstanding. It was going into the artists' uh, uh, at plays and uh, talking to them. And I, I spoke French uh, all the time that I was not on the, in the group. And always, definitely, always bonjour, huh? and also bonjour, ne. Bonjour, ne, bonjour, ne, as well. But it was just, uh, it was, a, it was. It was very worthwhile, and everybody I know has their own individual way of going on a trip. Uh, this really worked very well, especially for people who are solos, solo that's travelers. True. That's true, Robbie. Uh, you know, it's definitely something to be considered. And one of the neat things about the Facebook page that I indicated to you is that you can find lots of tour recommendations from people that have been on these tours and you know they'll recommend them very strongly and thank you Michelle for sharing what was no doubt a very painful experience uh, remember we talked earlier about distractions it's you know they're strategically planned distractions and that's how they work and uh, you know you can also if you want to get depressed <laughs> You can Google before you go, what are the top pickpocketing scams on the Côte d'Azur right now? And then you can become aware of, of what the top or current strategies are. 
but uh, I haven't been pickpocketed in I think 20 or 30 years. So uh, very painful, very painful. Always have a copy of your passport uh, with you and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think, I'm sorry to end on that sad note, but it's, it's, it's a good warning. And I hope that all of you picked up some information that you can find helpful as you you know, globally think about uh, your next trip to the Côte d'Azur and uh, feel free to reach out to me. I think you've uh, got my email or, you know, Otilia can follow up and, and send everybody my email. Uh, I'd love to hear any comments or questions that you have separately and, um, and connect you with any of those resources that I mentioned. Okay, thanks very much. We're over time. Thank you, Otilia, for having me and it was wonderful to see you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks. everyone. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. There's so many questions, but the time is up. So thank you, everyone. Bye.